All right. So we have started the recording. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the class today on the Book of Romans. We have uh, been progressing through the Book of Romans today. We are going to pick up chap um, pick up in chapter six, where we, where we paused last week. So welcome everyone. Let's just uh, pray and um, we'll get started. Okay. Can we, um, can somebody lead us in prayer, please? We'll get started. Okay, I'll pray. All right, thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning and for this wonderful time, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you have given us this opportunity to come together and learn from the world, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this day. As you learn, Lord God, I pray that your spirit may walk in, in each one of us, Lord Jesus. Uh, help us to understand, help us to grasp, and help us to comprehend everything that our pastor is going to teach, Lord Jesus. I pray that the spirit to anoint our pastor. And as we learn, let each of those words be alive in our in our heart and in our in our life, Lord Jesus, and in our soul, Lord God. We thank you for this opportunity once again, and we submit and we anoint each one of us into your hand. Thank you, Father. For in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Chuan. Thank you. All right. So let's go to Romans chapter six. Um, I have. Um, I uh, uploaded the PDF for uh, chapter seven and eight, uh, just in case. So, uh, uh, hopefully, we will be able to start off uh, at least chapter seven today, and um, we may be able to get into chapter eight. But I just put it out there. So, just a quickly review where we uh, some of the things, key things we saw. In Romans chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul has introduced us to this uh, amazing truth about identification. And just to you know, put it in a very concise way, he's contrasting the first man and the second man. The first Adam and the last Adam. So a parallel reference or a cross reference we said was also from First uh, uh, Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. So we use that as a, a cross reference. But essentially what uh, Paul is telling us is the entire human race is identified in the first man, Adam. This first man, Adam, was disobedient and because of which sin came into this world, condemnation, all of that resulting in death. So everything between from sin to death and everything in between came because of the first man, Adam. One man sinned, but the entire human race is identified in that one man and therefore we are all sinned and all are under death. But he tells us that this first man is only a type of the one who is to come, which is the second man. The second man, the first man was a was a prototype. The first man was a prototype of, or let, let's say the first man, Adam, was just a sample. <laughs> the real man is Jesus, the second man. But he's also called the last Adam, meaning in Jesus, everything about the Adam, Adam's race comes to an end. Last Adam. And, and Paul teaches us in Romans 5 that we, all of us who believe are now identified in this second man or the last Adam. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15, he refers to him as the man from heaven, the spiritual man or the heavenly man. So we are all identified in him. He says, in Adam we die, but in Christ we are all made alive. And so in back in Romans 5, he says, in the first man, uh, sorry, in 
the second man or the last Adam in, in Christ, we have received the free gift, which is abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, eternal life, and the authority and dominion to reign in life. All this comes to us through the second man or the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ. So then as we move on to chapter six, he says, oh, so we have abundance of grace. So should we just continue sinning? Because uh, grace can abound. And then we saw, he says, no, that's not the point. That is not what God is getting to us. And then he says, you know, I, I'm just paraphrasing, of course. He says, okay, let me tell you something more about being identified in this second man or the last Adam. And he says, don't you know that we are dead with him? We, are, we were buried with him. We were resurrected with him. We ascended with him and seated with him. So the ascend, ascending and seating is in other epistles he mentions. When Romans 6, he makes it very clear, we are crucified with him. We are buried with him. We are resurrected with him. So he says, look, our identification with him goes a little deeper. And each aspect of this process or these steps in this identification has meaning. Uh, it, it has spiritual truth, which then plays out in our everyday life as believers. So we saw that in Romans 6, that we were crucified with Christ. This was uh, Romans 6 and verse 6. We are crucified with him. That means when Christ died, we died. And uh, in verse 6, Romans 6, verse 6, Paul explains, he says, your old man was crucified with him. So the old man is the, referring to Adam, the Adamic nature, the sinful nature that comes through Adam. So it, Christ is the last Adam. What happened? In Christ, the old man was put to death. He was brought to an end. And so uh, the sinful nature was crucified. So you and I don't have an old man. We have a new man. What is the new man? It's the life and the nature of God. So he says, your old man was crucified with him. And what is the result? The result is the body of sin has been removed. The body of sin meaning uh, the totality of sin. So the word body in the New Testament is used in different ways. And depending on the context, uh, you know, we interpret it. So the body could be physical body. Or it could say the body of Christ, which is again, which is talking about a collective, that's a group of believers, all the believers, body of Christ. And it also is used in the sense of a sum totality of something. So the body of sin, meaning all of sin put together, the power of sin, the strength of sin. So in Romans 6, 6, he says, the body of sin was removed or done away with, so that we no longer should serve sin. And so we said, you know, as believers, we are crucified with Christ. The old man is gone. We are free from sin. And then he says in verse 7, he who has died has been freed from sin. So you, you are not basically saying you and I are dead people. We are dead. The old man is dead. And uh, uh, as far as sin is concerned, we are dead. You know, and we put up this simple a uh, picture of, you know, uh, an alcoholic. You think of an alcoholic uh, all his life, you know, uh, or, or for the better part of his life, he, he's just drunk. But if this alcoholic dies, if he's, when he's dead, they can place, you know, the, his most favorite liquor, alcohol bottles around him. He's not going to twitch a single muscle. He's not going to respond to it. Why? He's dead. And Paul says, that's you and me, as far as sin is concerned. Verse 7, he who has died has been freed from sin. We died with Christ, we are freed from sin. Okay, that's the first truth he brings out. Then 
uh, so so uh, we we are identified with Christ or we are united with him also in his burial so verse 4 Romans 6 verse 4 I'm just reviewing some of these things from last week Romans 6 verse 4 we were buried with him so we said when a man is buried the earth life has no more claim on him he's gone he's is past. So even if on the in his earth life, if he had a lot of debt, if he had court cases against him, whatever, when he's buried, he's dead and buried. It's all gone. Uh, those claims cannot affect him anymore. So basically, what we're saying is, when the Bible says we were buried with him, that means the old life the past life before Christ is gone, has no more claim on you and me, cannot attach itself to you and me, the old life. Now, the devil will want to make us think that mm, we are still subject to these things. See? The devil doesn't want us to know the truth. And uh, these, these things that we are seeing here are very powerful truths. He doesn't want us to know it because if they know the truth, we can resist what the devil tries to put up, put off on the believer, right? So the devil would, you know, one of the tactics for the believer is the devil's against the believers. Oh, you have to live like this in sin. Now, you know, you're going to be in bondage to sin. It's okay. No, it's not okay. When Christ is, when, when, when the old man is crucified, Paul is saying, why should we live under sin? Similarly, when we have been buried with him, why should the old life have any more claim on us? Why should it even trouble us in any manner? And the third thing is, he says in verse 4 and 5, we are raised from the dead with him. Oh, sorry. To walk in newness of life. That's verse 4, end of verse 4. So our resurrection is telling us we are walking in newness of life, a new life. And interestingly, he uses the word for zoe, for life. Zoe means we are walking in the newness of the God kind of life. So resurrected means we are now living in the zoe life of God, the abundant life of God. That's the life we are walking in, God's life, God's nature, right? So we've been crucified, we've been buried, and we've been resurrected, right? Now, in Romans 6, he does not address the ascending part and being seated with Christ, right? That is addressed in other epistles, but, you know, for the sake of completion, we will we'll just spend a few moments on it. So, when Christ ascended, you and I ascended. So Ephesians 2 and verse 6 says that we were raised together with him. You know, we were raised together with him. Or even same thing in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, you know, if you then were raised together with Christ, right? So what does it mean to be raised together with Jesus? When he ascended, we ascended spiritually. That means the system of this world, has no more control on the believer. Why? The believer has been taken out spiritually. The system of evil and rebellion. So those who are living in the world, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 1, there's a spirit of disobedience that is at work. They are under the control of the prince of the power of the air. So we refer to that as a system of evil and rebellion. That means they're under that influence. You and I are not under that influence because we've been raised with Jesus. So the darkness that envelops the earth cannot dominate, cannot influence us as believers. Why? We were raised with Jesus. We've been taken out of that spiritually. So, of course, in the natural, we are here on this earth and there is darkness all around us, just, you know, spiritual darkness. There is corruption, there is moral decay, there is degradation, but that cannot and should not dominate the believer. Why? 
because spiritually we've been raised together with him. We've been taken out of this. And so we can dominate that and not let the darkness dominate us. We are light. We are more powerful than darkness. But most believers don't know that. And so most believers are living, you know, under the influence of darkness. Uh, darkness seems to tor torment them. The pull of this world seems to be so big and so strong. And the attractions of the world seem to be affecting them. I'm not denying that it's there because we are on the earth. But the spiritual truth is we were raised together with him. So our affections are fixed on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay. And then we were seated together with him. What does that mean? It means we've been put in the place of highest authority. God could not place you and me in any high, other higher place. And it's like God saying, hey, come sit next to me. We are seated together with Christ. We are crucified together with Christ. We are buried together with Christ. We are resurrected together with Christ. We were raised up together with Christ and we were made to sit together with Christ. So spiritually, as believers, we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. So in the heavenly realms, you and I are seated on the highest possible throne. That's with Christ, we're seated with him. So that's our place of authority and dominion in the spiritual realm. And this is truth. So now in this earth, we operate from that place of authority. So when we confront demonic powers, when we are faced with life situations, what do we do? We operate from that place of dominion and authority. So I am seated with Christ in heavenly places, and I'm going to exert my authority. Now remember one thing, we are not striving for authority. We are exerting our authority. So many believers are under the impression that we have to strive for authority, right? So you have to fast and pray, and you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to strive for authority. No, 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 no. You cannot strive for authority. You have to exert authority. You are in a place of authority. Now you exert that authority by faith in God, by using the word of God, by using the power that's there in the name of Jesus. That to, by using what God has given to us, we exert the authority that we, are, that we already have because we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are not striving for authority. You know, I'm, if I, if I you know, fast for so many days or if I pray for so many hours, now I believe in all the spiritual disciplines. And we are not against spiritual disciplines. But what we are saying is the reason we do that spiritual disciplines is to keep ourselves in good spiritual condition so that we can exert the authority, that we could make use of the things God has given to us. Uh, we are, we, so that you know, we are fit to use what God has given to us. That's why. So understand that you are seated with Christ. Part of our identification is we are seated with him. You are in that place of authority. Okay, so coming back to Romans 6, after Paul has helped us understand this truth of identification now in Romans 5 and Romans 6, he then says, okay, what do you do with it? How do you live it out? And his primary interest is in dealing with sin. How do we live out of this truth with respect to overcoming sin? That's the primary focus. Now, that does not mean um, it doesn't have other implications, that this truth of identification does not have other implications. In other epistles, we see Paul telling the believer, you know, for example, we mentioned Colossians 3 1. He said, If you then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So that's the, uh, you know uh, uh, another way of applying the truth of identification. But in Romans 6, the focus of his 
interest is we are identified with Christ. So how can we live in holiness because of that? So really, Romans 6, 7 and 8, the most part of Romans 8, is answering that question. You're in Christ. You've been identified. How can you live holy? How can you live, overcome sin? Right? So um, uh, let's pick up now from verse uh, 10. Okay, Romans 6, verse 10. And just kind of build out here now on how he is, tells us to live out of um, this truth. Okay, so could somebody read for us Romans chapter 6, verse 10 to 14. Romans 6, 10 to 14, please. Sure. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Mm, thank you. So, he says, so verse 10, he's pointing to Jesus. Let's so look at Jesus. Okay. He died, and he died just once. He died to sin once for all. And he lives. He's alive. He lives to God. So, Saying, you know, this is reality. Christ died once for all, and he's alive unto God. He's alive. And then he begins verse 11, says, likewise. That means there's a connection between 10, verse 10, what he said in verse 10, and what he's going to tell us now. Likewise means in the same manner. Just as Jesus died once and he's alive to God in the same way. We have to live. He died for sin once. He's alive to God. Fully consecrated, dedicated to the Father in the same manner. It's just likewise. Reckon yourselves. Now, uh, uh, I know you know some of the modern translations would use the word "consider yourselves," but that word "reckon" is, uh, or the word "consider," if you look at it in the Greek, is a, is an accounting word. And um, uh, you know, the the uh, the the idea is the idea is uh, accounting is the you know if uh, example this is example if a person is counting uh, doing counting he's accounting uh, he counts it you know ten he has ten ten notes each is valued ten so he counts ten ten notes each valued ten total is hundred. Now, you can count it from top to bottom. You can count it from bottom to top. How you count it, it's 10 times 10, 100, meaning it's a done thing. No questions on this. So that's reckoning. That means it's final. I've checked it. It's done. No more arguments. It cannot be disputed. It cannot be... Uh, in any way questioned. So he says, in the same way, you reckon yourself, you count yourself, or you consider yourself as what? He says, dead to sin, alive to God. 
likewise, like Christ. Christ died once for all to sin, he's alive to God, in the same manner the believer says, I am dead to sin, I'm alive to God. Meaning it's, I once and for all embrace this, accept it, I reckon it, I consider it, I take it as a fact. I am dead to sin, I'm alive to God. That means I have nothing to do with sin. I have everything to do with God. So how do I live this out? First thing, I can myself to be dead to sin. Not uh, in a casual sense, meaning, okay, yeah, sin, you know, it's nice, but because pastor said, or because Sunday is coming, I'll stay away from sin for two days. Monday onwards, I'll sin a little bit. It's not like that, right? He's saying, once for all, count yourself to be dead to sin, alive to God. So the believer comes to this place, having understood what God has done in identification for us. They come to this place with saying, I'm done with sin. I reckon myself to be dead to sin. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm not playing with it. Dead. But that's the problem with many believers. They haven't done verse 11, which means to consider yourself as someone who's dead to sin. So, okay, you know, play a little bit with sin. All right, you know, slowly I'll come out of it. See, these are the different things we, we tend to take. Slowly I'll come out of sin, you know. Uh, yeah, but Paul is not saying, you know, slowly come out of sin. He says, hey, consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. Step one, if, if, you know, if you want to break it down into steps, you can say, that's the first thing. A believer needs to come to that place and say, hey, I'm done with sin because I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God, just like Christ. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. Now, having accepted that truth, next verse, he says, Therefore, now because you have really accepted this and said, look, I'm done with sin. Therefore, so that word therefore is a connecting word. Therefore, consequently, or because of, what happens? Therefore, don't let sin reign in your body. I'm just saying, I refuse to give sin any place in my body. I refuse to give sin any place in me. Why? Because, verse 11, I have reckoned that I am dead to sin. I'm alive to God. So sin has no place in me. No place. So the believer becomes, next step, the believer, verse, verse 12, the believer becomes intolerant towards sin. It's like there's no thing of tolerating it. Gives sin no place in your body. And then verse 13. Don't yield your body to sin, your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. So now, by an act of my will, so now I'm making a choice here. Yeah? Verse 13, God, uh, my, sorry, verse 13, my body is not going to be a weapon of sin. The word instrument there simply means weapon, and it's a very strong word. Your body is not going to be a weapon of sin, but you're saying, God, I'm 100% yours, present yourself to God. God, I'm 100% yours, and my body is your weapon for righteousness. And as my body is going to advance righteousness. 
So how do we live out of this truth with respect to sin? He says, first of all, embrace this truth. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. I have nothing to do with sin. Second, verse 12, give no place to sin in your being. Do not let sin reign in your body. And third, don't yield yourself to sin, but instead present yourself to God so that you become a weapon of righteousness. It means I'm yielding myself completely to God. I'm a weapon of righteousness, is what he says. And the reason Paul says we can do this, verse 14, because sin will not have dominion over you. Why? Because its power was broken in verse 6, he says. So sin will not have dominion over you. Sin, is, sin has no right to have any dominion, any control over the believer. That's why we can do what he's telling us. And then he says, because you're not under law, but under grace. In other words, here's another important distinction he's drawing. He says, you're not under law, you're under grace. Now he's going to expand this in Romans 7. So keep this in mind. He's drawing a contrast, under law, under grace. Romans 7, he'll expand it. Under law, the law told us what is the right thing to do. But it never gave us the power to do the right thing. Under grace, grace tells us what is the right thing to do. And also empowers us to do the right thing. The standards under grace are much higher than the standards under the law. If you think of it, the law says, do not kill. Grace says, do not hate. Because if you hate, you're a murderer. So the standards under grace are higher than under the law. But grace empowers us to live by those standards. Under the law, the law said, don't commit adultery. Under grace, the standard is higher. Don't even look lustfully at a woman. Because if you do, that's adultery. But grace says, I'll give you the power to live like this. So he says, verse 14, sin will not have any dominion over you because you're not under law, you're under grace. You're not under a system that tells you what is good but does not give you the power to do good. You're in a system where it tells you what is good but also gives you the power to do the good. So you're under grace. So this is how the believer should live, right? So now let's pick up here from verse, uh, we'll read verses 15 to 18, another short section and we'll look at it. Somebody could read please verses 15 to 18. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slave to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thank that though you were slave of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that from of doctrine of which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you become slave of righteousness. Mm. So, uh, verse 15 to 18, verses 15 to 18. Uh, he begins with this, again, this, you know, his, his style in Romans is to ask a rhetorical question, meaning, he asks a question that he's going to answer. And sorry, and the answer is implicit. It's right there. So he asks this rhetorical question, you know, oh, so should we just keep sinning because we're not under law but under grace? He says, no. Because why? Because he said, look, 
I've already told you to present verse, verse he's referencing back to verse 13. I already told you to present yourself to God. And when you present yourself, you're submitting yourself. You're becoming a slave. And he says, you were slaves of sin. So under law, you were a slave of sin. But under grace, you're a slave of righteousness. So under grace, we are slaves. Now people think, you know, under grace, we are free. But actually under grace, you're a slave. Under grace, we are slaves of righteousness. Under law, we were slaves of sin because the law make it, made it very evident that we couldn't keep the law and we had no power to overcome sin. So you ended up as slaves of sin. Under grace, we are slaves of God. We are slaves of righteousness. So why? Why are we slaves? Because we have presented, willingly present our, ourselves to God. So he says in verse 16, don't you know that whom you present yourselves to obey, you're a slave. So when we present, he's told us in verse 13, present yourself to God. So we've now become slaves of God to obey God. And therefore we are now slaves of righteousness. That means we are bond servants of righteousness. We have no option but to do righteousness because we have presented ourselves to God. And while he is saying that, he gives thanks to God, verses 17 and 18. It's very interesting when you look at it because he's contrasting two things. He says in verse 17, you were slaves of sin. In verse 18, you became slaves of righteousness. You were set free from sin. Verse 17, you were slaves of sin. Verse 18, you are set free from sin and became slaves of righteousness. What was the difference? What made the difference? Paul is saying, you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were delivered or which was delivered to you. So interesting. They were slaves of sin they became free from sin and slaves of righteousness. What made the difference? What caused them to go from being slaves of sin to becoming free from sin? They obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, the teaching that was given to them. Think about it. They were given a teaching And it's right here, what we are going through. And this teaching of that truth took them from being slaves of sin to being set free from sin and becoming slaves of righteousness. Now it's really interesting when you look at verse 17, where he says, you obeyed from the heart. That means they wholeheartedly obeyed. They wholeheartedly received and gave themselves to this teaching. The other thing we see very interesting in verse 17 is that form of doctrine. That word form in the Greek is interesting. It talks, it means, the word form simply means mold that mold of doctrine. So mold as in, you know, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the industry, when I mean, they want to make either plastic or metal or things in certain shapes, they have a mold. So they pour the liquid plastic or, or they put the plastic in, and uh, you know it uh, it uh, it melted and then 
it takes the shape of the mold into which it is poured or into which it is melted. So he's talking about that mold or, uh, you know, the, uh, the other words you can use is a cast or a dye, you know. So you pour the molten mold uh, liquid in and when it solidifies, it takes the shape of the mold. So that's the word he used. So he says, look, this teaching that was brought to you, this doctrine that was brought to you was like a mold. When you are a per, when you when people are obedient from the heart, that means when they are receiving it wholeheartedly, they are like this liquid that's being poured into this mold, which is the teaching. And then when they solidify, they come out different. So they were slaves of sin, they became set free from sin. Why? Because they wholeheartedly received the teaching. The teaching was the mold that cast them into this new state of being set free from sin and becoming slaves of righteousness. This truth. So that's why this truth needs to be communicated to the church. Because if the church receives this truth wholeheartedly, what will happen? Same result. The word of God will produce the same result today as it did for these people back then. It will take people who are slaves of sin and make them set free from sin and slaves of righteousness. Same word of God will do the same thing today. Right? So that's verses 15 to 18. And then verses 19 to 23, let's just finish this at Romans 6. He then sums up uh, what he is saying, but then he also recognizes a problem that believers still have. So there is this truth of identification. We have been taught here how to live out of that truth and what this truth can do for us. But there is one problem that has to be dealt with. And he brings it out here. Let's please read verses 19 to 23. Somebody could read it, please. Romans 6, 19 to 23. Maybe Thomas, you want to read? I'll read first. Uh, 19 to 23. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using this illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you are slaves to sin, you are free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do the things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become the slaves of God. How you do these things? How you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm. So, a few things, Paul. I just want to point out what Paul is saying. So Paul is saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm using this example of being a slave. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so he says, the, re the ultimate goal here is for us to walk in holiness. Notice he, he uses the word holiness twice. Verse 19 says, so that you'll be slaves of holiness, uh, righteousness for holiness. And again, he talks about it in verse 22. You'll have a fruit to holiness. So, so the goal here is holiness. As we apply this truth, we're going to overcome sin and we're going to walk in holiness. That's the ultimate is what Paul is getting to. But he says, there's one problem. That's in verse 19. 
It's the weakness of our flesh. Now the word flesh, uh, again, you know, uh, the word flesh can be used in, 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 the, in, the, in the New Testament. It can be used in so many different ways. It, flesh could be the, you know, the physical body. Flesh could be, you know, the, yeah, so the, anything that's the physical body, the outer man. But it also deals, refers to the sinful, evil desires of the outer man, the body. Right? So that's the way it's used here, flesh. So flesh is talking about the natural evil desires, natural evil desires of the body. The, again, in Galatians 5, he talks about you know, the works of the flesh are these. It's the evil desires of the body. So he says, there is a weakness in your flesh. And he's going to elaborate this problem in the next chapter in Romans 7, the weakness of the flesh. So there is the truth of identification. This is how we can walk in it. Sin has no power against us. And as we walk in it, we will be slaves of righteousness and we will have the fruit or the result of holiness in our lives. But there is a problem. The weakness of our flesh. So, but there is a warning. He says, look, if you continue in sin, the result of sin is only death. So if we go back and live in sin, it will only result in death. But God has given us this free gift, which will lead us to eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we don't have to live in sin, ending up in death. We can walk in eternal life. We can walk in this free gift, which is eternal life. Like verse 23. So chapter 7 is this whole discussion or this whole uh, yeah, use the word discussion about the weakness of the flesh. And it is very interesting, we will look at it, where he talks about the struggle of a man who has the law of God. He wants to obey God, but he doesn't have the power to do it. because of the weakness of the flesh. And he explains why the flesh has been weakened. And then when we get into chapter eight, he says, for a born again believer, this is the answer, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. So this truth in Romans six, the truth of identification is lived out like this. We, Reckon ourselves, verse 11, we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin. Verse 12, we refuse to sin, refuse to let sin reign in our bodies. Verse 13, we are completely presented to God as slaves so that we can become, we can be weapons of righteousness and walk in holiness. We know there's a weakness of the flesh, but chapter 8, there's the law of the spirit of life. The spirit of life, the Holy Spirit, enables us to conquer our flesh. So it's all connected. And we see in Romans, we will see in Romans 8, how the believer can live that victorious life. Okay, so we're gonna take a little break now. Sorry, I didn't give you any time for questions. Uh, we'll take a little break. When we come back from the break, we'll take questions and then we'll get into Romans chapter seven, okay? Thank you. We'll be back in 10 minutes, please. Thank you. <laughs> 